My name is Beth. I'm the community programming librarian with the Mid-Continent Public Libraries. This evening, uh, we are joined by Doug Richardson of the Harry S. Truman National Historic Site. I did want to mention some upcoming programs uh, that we're having. Um, some of you may have attended the first uh, session of the book group that uh, Doug is also leading for us. Um, which is a guided tour of Truman by uh, David McCullough. Um, they are meeting next on April 6th at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Um, and every uh, month they cover uh, on the first Thursday two <laughs> chapters of the book. Um, so this is the second session. They'll be covering chapters um, three and four of uh, Truman by David McCullough. Um, you can uh, Come uh, when you're interested in chapter, in specific chapters or topics, or come for all of them. Um, they are being recorded and put on our YouTube channel. So if you miss a session, um, you can always go back and watch it. With that, I am going to mute myself and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Doug. So he can introduce himself and we can get started with this evening's program. Beth, thank you, my friend. I am grateful to you. I am grateful to everybody at Mid-Continent Public Library. My name is Doug Richardson. I am the program manager and the chief ranger here at Harry S. Truman National Historic Site. Locals mostly call us the Truman Home. And as I look to my left, I am looking at the backside of the Truman Home as I speak to you tonight. I am speaking from the bedroom of Beth Wallace Truman's brother's house. I'm speaking to you from the home of George P. Wallace and his lovely wife, May which is also part of the legislative boundary of Harry S. Truman National Historic Site. This park is a unit of the National Park Service, and this unit commemorates and celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. And we would not be able to do what we do for you, the American people, if it weren't for you of the American people. So I thank you for supporting ours and all of the national park units across the country. And we would also not be able to do what we do here if it were not for the lady of the hour, Mrs. Beth Wallace Truman, because it was in her last will and testament in which she left her family's home at 219 North Delaware Street to the American people together with the contents of her family's home. And so if you have been through the Truman home or if you haven't, please come and see us. Please know that you are able to do that because of that incredible gift that she gave to the American people four decades ago. What a wonderful gift that was. In just a few weeks, I will begin my 30th year with the National Park Service. I was born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which if you've never heard of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, it is about 85 miles due east of Pittsburgh. Johnstown, Pennsylvania is probably known mostly for a series of deadly floods, the, the worst and the most deadly of which happened on May 31st of 1889 and killed over 2,209 men, women, and children. And that story was told incredibly by David McCullough. That started my lifelong association, fascination, and respect for David McCullough that follows to this day. My career with the National Park Service started at a United States National Park Service site called Johnstown Flood National Memorial. 
which preserves the ruins of the earthen dam that broke, causing the Johnstown flood. So I worked there for about 17 years together with some other National Park Service sites in Western Pennsylvania. For a period of time, I also worked at a Civil War battlefield in Tennessee at Fort Donaldson National <coughs> Battlefield, which was a Ulysses Grant, a battlefield story. I wanted to dive deeply into the Ulysses Grant story <laughs> a bit. But my parents were both Korean War veterans. Doug? Yes? Your camera is off. My camera's off. Let me fix that. Let me fix that. How's that? Now we can see your screen. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. My parents were both Korean War veterans. Both had a fascination with Harry Truman. So Truman had always been a part of my life. Plus an undergraduate school, I had done some extensive work on Harry Truman, specifically the Marshall Plan. Also, in 1992, David McCullough's biography of Harry Truman was released. And then shortly after that, two other major biographies of Harry Truman were released by Alonzo Hamby and Robert Farrell. So Truman was part of the national conversation. So when I joined the National Park Service and went to my very first ranger training in Morristown, New Jersey on how to be a National Park Service park ranger. As part of that orientation, when they were asking us if you could pick what your dream park would be, my colleagues in the room, many of them were saying they would love to work at Yosemite National Park or Yellowstone National Park. My Civil War buff friends were saying Gettysburg or Vicksburg. Well, when it was my turn, I simply said, I would love to work at Harry S. Truman National Historic Site because the place very much had a special meaning to me in many ways. It took me a long time to get there, but in January 2017, and it finally happened. Well, it's got an and just a few days. After I arrived here in January of 2017, I went over to the headquarters of Mid-Continent Public Library, and I met with a fellow by the name of Dylan, and I said, I would love to develop programs with you at Mid-Continent, one, because I am a big believer in America's public library system. I believe that our public libraries are a bedrock of who we are as Americans. And plus, I know that Beth Wallace Truman, she very much loved the library system, and that was an important part of her life. And Dylan and Lisa and so many, and, and so many others, we came up with some programming ideas. And the programs that we came up with have been nothing but a pure joy. And quite honestly, I've lost count of the number of programs that the National Park Service and Mid-Continent have partnered up with over the last few years. And in no way, shape, or form could I call any of them work. They have been pure joy to do and just an awful lot of fun. So what we are doing tonight is Elizabeth Virginia Wallace Truman, an appreciation of a life well lived and I'm offering this on behalf of all of us here at Harry S. Truman National Historic Site, the Truman Home. And this is in partnership with my dear friends down the road at the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum, which is operated by the National Archives and in partnership with our dear friends at Mid-Continent Public Library. The National Park Service recognizes that we really can't do anything by ourselves 
we are only successful when we work with partners and we are so blessed here at Truman in that we have the most wonderful partners. Elizabeth Virginia Wallace Truman was born while Chester Allen Arthur was president of the United States. Have you ever thought about when you were born and think about who has been president of the United States during your lifetime? And think about it in milestones like that. And think about Bess Truman's 97 years on our beautiful earth. Ronald Reagan was president when Bess Truman died in 1982. So during her lifetime, she lived during presidencies of Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland again, who is the 22nd and 24th president of the United States, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and there was uh, another guy whose whose name I noticed I forgot to mention there, and uh, what's his name? It's right on the on the tip of our tongue, but I'm sure his name will come up here in in just a few moments. Elizabeth Virginia Wallace Truman's parents were these two individuals. The gentleman on the left, a very handsome gentleman, David Willock Wallace, his father, very briefly, was a one-time mayor of Independence, Missouri, David F. Wallace. And uh, Beth Wallace Truman's mother was the lovely Madge Gates Wallace. And Madge Gates Wallace was born just a few days before the Battle of Antietam. These two came from very well respected families. Again, David Willock Wallace's father was one time mayor of Independence, Missouri. Madge Gates Wallace's father was a native of the state of Vermont. Her mother was, so, yes. Um, your slides are not advancing. They are not advancing. What are what ones are you seeing right now? Uh, we are just seeing the picture of Bess. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. Let's try this. What do you see now, my friend? Uh, we are still seeing the same picture of Bess. How about we stop the share and try again? Yes. Okay. All right, what do you see now? Uh, it says Chester Arthur was president. Now we see uh, David and Margaret. Okay, okay, very good, very good. Okay. All right. Madge Gates Wallace's mother was from Great Britain. It's not exactly clear the circumstances as to how and why Elizabeth Emery arrived in the United States. The thinking is that there was some type of an illness that was running in the family and the family to prevent her from catching the illness had her sent to the United States. At some point 
probably in the state of Illinois, George Porterfield Gates and Elizabeth Emery met and married. And it was in Port Byron, Illinois, that Madge Gates Wallace was born in August of 1862, again, just a few days before the Battle of Antietam. So she was born in the midst of the American Civil War. And then shortly after that, the family moved here to Independence, Missouri. Now, the place that we call today the Truman Home, 219 North Delaware Street, one of the mysteries about the physical structure is when was it originally built? The part that the kitchen is in, some believe that it dates to 1867. Some believe that it may date to before that. But when George Porterfield Gates arrived in town, he eventually became a partner in a flour mill not too far from here that became known as the Wagoner Gates Flour Mill. And they produced a product here in Independence their biggest product that was known as the queen of the pantry flower that was sold throughout the Midwest. And, and one of their advertisements said that a majority of the cakes and cookies and baked products made in this region were made using the queen of the pantry flower. Now, what that meant was that the flour mill created some generational wealth here. So George Porterfield Gates did well for himself. Now, was he a millionaire? No, probably not. But relatively speaking here in independence, he was quite well to do and well respected. Now on the other side of the family on the political side, so was David Willock Wallace's family well respected. David Wallace's father, in addition to once being a mayor of Independence, had a bicycle shop here in town, so a well respected businessman as well. So they linked up David Willock Wallace, Madge Gates Wallace. Now, the family tradition has that George Gates was a little cautious about the match, worried about whether David Wallace was going to be able to properly take care of Madge the way that George Gates thought that his daughter deserved to be taken care of. Now, that may be the the same concern that any father would have for their daughter, but George Gates eventually gave his blessing. And I wanted to share with you, uh, if you could see the screen there, you'll see the wedding invitation from the summer of 1883 at First Presbyterian Church. It was a joyous wedding held at First Presbyterian Church. And after the brief wedding at First Presbyterian, the wedding reception was held here at the Gates home at 219 North Delaware Street. And it was said that the yard was decorated in Chinese lanterns. And it was said to have been just simply a magical night. Now, a special wedding gift was given to the new Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, and it is a wedding gift that you, my friends, can still see to this very day when you visit the Truman home. And you will see it in the dining room to this very day. And it is that object that you see on the screen there. Now, 
One of Beth Flawless Truman's grandsons, a fellow by the name of Clifton Truman Daniel, has a wonderful nickname for that. He calls it a Victorian thingamabob, but the a technical term for it is an epern. It is sterling silver epern. And what is it? What was it for? Well, almost anything that you would want to use it for. When I look at the epern, I see where you could keep flowers in it. I see where perhaps you could keep candies or nuts or perhaps candles in it. Now, today, in the top of the epern, there happen to be some marbles and a hairpin because when Clifton Truman Daniel, that grandson of Beth Wallace Truman, when he was a little boy visiting grandmother here in Independence, he was playing with marbles one day here and his grandmother caught him rolling and throwing marbles down into one of the heat vents here in the Truman home. Grandmother caught him and confiscated the marbles and put the marbles in the top of that epern so that the little grandson couldn't reach them again. And they remain in that position to this, this very day. Now, over the years, we wish we had a little more insight into that epern, but we are just very grateful that it still sits inside of 219 North Delaware Street. Again, thanks to the family, it belongs to you, the American people. And so I warmly invite you to come back to the Truman Home and see the Epern for yourself. And so baby Elizabeth Virginia Wallace was born in a beautiful little house on Ruby Street in Independence on February 13th of 1885. And if you like historic homes, this house, excuse me, this house is still standing in Independence to this very day, still down on Ruby Street. And there is a photograph there of young Bessie Wallace. And yes, indeed, you can still come and see that house. And I wanted to share with you tonight a sort of a rare document. And I wanted to, this is the Registry of Birth, Independence, Missouri from 1885. I wanted to blow this up. I wanted to show you February 15th, 1885, Bessie Virginia Wallace, born to Madge E. Gates, Margaret Elizabeth Gates, and David W. Wallace. Primary documents are just so wonderful. And when you look at primary documents like this, sometimes you wonder when somebody was writing that ledger on that document in 1885, did they have any idea that someday Bessie Virginia Wallace, a beautiful baby born on Ruby Street, the daughter of Madge and David Wallace would someday be first lady of the United States the power of primary documents. Plus, when you look at that document, I often wonder whatever happened to some of the other people on that list, because you notice right below her, there's the Grover Cleveland. Now, I have not been able to make out that last name, but I often wonder what happened to some of the other people on this list. Everybody has a story, and I wonder what some of the other stories are. Now, this is a photograph, one of the lesser seen photographs of Bessie Wallace, circa 1890. Now, Bessie Wallace's grandparents, George Porterfield Gates and Elizabeth Emery Gates, were members at First Presbyterian Church, just a block away from here. And for years, there was even a, a scholarship named for George Porterfield 
Gates. And because of that family relationship, that is where Beth Wallace and her siblings attended Sunday school for a while. And that is how she looked in 1890. Now, one day in 1890, a new family, a family that had just moved to Independence, Missouri, a family that had just moved to Independence from Grandview. This family had moved here from Grandview because Independence had the best schools in the area. This family's last name was Truman. The mother of the family, a lady by the name of Martha Ellen Young Truman, happened to have a conversation with the pastor of First Presbyterian Church. And they had a very good conversation. And the pastor of First Presbyterian invited Mrs. Truman to bring her children to the Sunday school at First Presbyterian Church. Now, the Truman family, they happened to be Baptist. But Mrs. Truman thought that it might be a good idea if they attended the Presbyterian Sunday School. And so they did. And so Mama Truman brought her oldest son to the Sunday School at First Presbyterian. And it was at that Sunday School where that oldest son happened to see the young lady that you see there on the screen. And that boy, about six years old, fell in love with that young lady and never fell out of love. Now, what history does not remember is whether five-year-old Bessie Wallace paid any attention to that six-year-old boy then or much after that. Now, eventually, Bessie Wallace had three brothers, and I chose one of my favorite photographs to show a couple of those brothers. Shortly after Bessie was born, she had a brother by the name of George Porterfield Wallace. And then she had another brother by the name of Frank Gates Wallace. And that is how they looked about 1895, 1896. Now, David Willock Wallace, he had he had some financial challenges. David Willock Wallace had some political jobs, and as sometimes happens with political jobs, sometimes those jobs come and go. And sometimes when those jobs go, sometimes ends can can be hard to to meet eventually david wallace it appears had to let go of the house on ruby street now some sources say that he was able to actually trade the house on ruby street but he eventually was able to buy another house it no longer stands but they had another house at 608 North Delaware Street. The house no longer stands, but there is an oak tree that still stands on the property to this day. And one of the reasons that I chose this photograph of Bessie Wallace and George and Frank is that this is about how about how the three siblings looked at about the time that they were moving into the Delaware Street house. For Bessie Wallace, even though there were times where her father was, was struggling, and, and by this time that they were moving into the Delaware Street house, things were we're looking up a little bit. He was able to get a federal position with the customs office. Bessie Wallace 
was being raised by her mother to be really the quintessential Victorian lady. She looked apart. She was beautiful. He had the best clothes. But at the same time, Bessie Wallace was known as perhaps the best athlete in independence. She was known as perhaps the best baseball player in independence. And there are some wonderful stories of Bess Wallace being called in to rescue a baseball game in the, in the middle of a game, helping her brothers out, even while in formal dress. Could you imagine Bess Wallace hopping into the middle of a ball game and hitting a dinger, running around the bases in full dress and full compliment Victorian dress? How wonderful an image that is. She was known as a marvelous tennis player. She was a marvelous ice skater. You name the sport, she could do it. She was so well loved in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood, one of the things the kids looked forward to in the evening was when she would step out onto the porch, I, I, I've i never been able to whistle well, but she would step out onto the porch and she had a special whistle that all of her friends knew. And when she whistled, that was her signal to her friends to come over and have some fun have some ice cream, have a dessert. She studied with her friends. She was a, a marvelous student. I'll show you something here in, in just a few moments. She was an absolute delight. Well loved by adults and and her her friends alike. And she was living what must have been almost a dream-like life. One of the lines that I like from David McCullough's book, Truman, was he, he writes about independence at this time, late 19th century, about how while there was electrification in, in independence, that it was still a time where you could come out at night and it was still pitch black and you could see all of the stars and the planets in the sky and without much in the way of disturbance by streetlights or anything that we have today. And so if you could imagine Beth and George and Frank and, and her friends and even their dog, who had a wonderful name by the name of you know, just just living a charmed life on Delaware Street in Independence. They would probably tell you that life might not get much better for them. She was a good student. Now here is her fourth grade report card and good marks. Boy, I, I look back on my fourth grade report card and I wish I had marks like that in spelling. I even wish I had marks like that in drawing and in art. Uh, those deportment grades are terrific, 100% in deportment. Um, I look back in fourth grade, and my grades certainly weren't like that, especially in, in deportment. Much like her eventual famous husband, we don't have a whole lot of papers from 
for school years, but we do have some. But what we do have show just an absolutely uh, remarkable mind. And you can see it there, spe uh, spelling, reading, writing, geography, language, drawing, writing, arithmetic department. Uh, and Mrs. David Willock Wallace, very, probably absolutely very proud to sign that report card. And I, I just want to take an opportunity to encourage all of you If you have your report cards or if you have your children's or your grandchildren's report cards, please save them because too often we hear people who say, I wish I had, I wish I had. And very much in the, in the case of so many famous people, we, we don't have. And in the case of Bess and Harry Truman, there, there's a lot that we just we just don't have. We have next to nothing from Harry Truman's school years, and we wish we had more from Beth Wallace Truman's personal history, so please save them. Now, Beth Wallace Truman, born in 1885. Harry S. Truman was born May 8th of 1884, so he was a little older than her. Now, a few years after Harry Truman and his family moved to Independence, Harry Truman had a terrible bout with diphtheria. A terrible bout that paralyzed him to the point where his mother had to push him around in a baby carriage for a while. And there were doubts as to whether or not Truman was going to recover from that. Well, he eventually did. But if there was a positive to Truman having to battle with that diphtheria was that as he got back into attending school physically, he was attending school school now physically with Beth Wallace. He again had met Bessie Wallace at First Presbyterian Church at Sunday School, and he described her many years later as a beautiful little girl with the gorgeous blue eyes and the curly blonde hair. But as I said earlier, did she know who he was? There's no indication that she ever did. He fell in love with her that day and never fell out of love with her. But it really wasn't reciprocal. Now, eventually, the, the Trumans who lived on Chrysler Street, they eventually moved to Waldo Street. So the Trumans on Waldo Street lived very close to the Wallaces who lived at 608 North Delaware. So eventually, once in a while, Harry Truman and Beth Wallace would walk to school together. Uh, T being close to W in alphabetics, they would sit close together. But by all sense of appearances, it was a one-sided love affair. There was no indication that Miss Wallace ever showed any affection. Now they studied together. Harry Truman had an aunt and an uncle and some cousins who lived across the street from 219 North Delaware Street at 216 North Delaware, the Nolan. And at the Nolan home, Harry Truman and Beth Wallace studied with Ethel and, Nephi, and Nellie Nolan. But they knew, uh, Ethel and Nellie Nolan knew that, that Truman had a, a crush on her, but there's no indication that it was ever reversed. So here we get into their senior year, and it's time for that obligatory senior photograph, and here we are. Photograph taken in May of 1901, Independence High School. And you'll notice in the window, 
There's a Latin phrase at the top of the window, Juventus Peace Mundi. Harry Truman loved that phrase. It simply means youth, the hope of the world. And I love senior class photographs because they, as today seniors know, when you're graduating from high school, you're always full of confidence by maybe a little bit of fear. You don't know what's quite coming, but you know that you're going to tackle the world, you know. In this particular photograph is something that has never been repeated in American history. In this photograph, you have a future president of the United States. You have a future first lady of the United States, and you have that president of the United States, future press secretary. So I'm gonna give you a few moments and see if you can, if you haven't seen this photograph before, see if you can pick out the president, the future president of the United States. He has a very confident look in his face. See if you can pick out the future first lady and the future press secretary who is actually the valedictorian of the class. The future president, whoop, oh, I need to go back. The future, whoop, oh, I'm sorry. The future president of the United States is right there, the fellow in the middle with his hand on his friend's shoulder. The glasses on, looking directly at the camera. The future first lady at the very end, second from the bottom, with a sort of bemused grin with a high collar a charming grin on her face. And that press secretary is on the very end, knees up in his chest. His name is Charles G. Ross. And he later won the Pulitzer Prize and later became President Truman's press secretary. So, and much like everybody in their senior year, you wonder what's next? What's next for me? How am I going to tackle the world? How am I going to change the world? And I'm sure Bess Wallace was thinking that. What's next for Bess Wallace? Well, unfortunately for Bess Wallace, it was tragedy. In June of 1903, David Willock Wallace and Madge Gates Wallace celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary. And about that time, their next door neighbor died, a lady by the name of Pack. And Mary Paxton. And David Wallach, David uh, Willock Wallace went next door and helped the family with the, the funeral, helped set up chairs and did everything that, that he could. June 17th, 1903. Very early in the morning, David Wallace arose. He got fully dressed. His wife was asleep. His four children, including his three-year-old child, his newest child, they were all asleep. David went into a drawer, got a pistol, stepped into a bathroom, closed the door, stepped into the bathtub, 
put the pistol to the back of his head and fired. We don't know why. When the shot was heard, George and Frank jumped out of bed, rushed into the bathroom, found their father. Madge Wallace raced into the bathroom and immediately, as you can imagine, was inconsolable and started to shriek. The noise wakened the neighbors. A doctor was called. The report said that they tried to revive Mr. Wallace. He managed to stay alive for a little while, but was pronounced dead after about 20 to 25 minutes. To add horror to the story, later that morning, the announcement that David Willock Wallace had died by suicide was the headline in the Kansas City Star, the Kansas City Times, and the Independence Examiner. Beth Wallace was 18 years old. At the time, Bess Wallace's best friend in the world was her next door neighbor, another young lady by the name of Mary Paxton. And Mary Paxton, who later was known as Mary Paxton Keeley, she remembered that when she heard the news about Mr. Wallace, she rushed next door. And when she got to the Wallace home at 608, that Bess was in the backyard, her fists were clenched, and she was pacing back and forth. And they just walked back and forth in the backyard and didn't say a word. Sometimes friends don't need to say a thing, just be there for one another. Bess Wallace Truman is not known to have said a word about this incident. It was rarely talked about in the family. The way that the story is commonly told is that shortly after the incident that Madge Gates Wallace, Bessie Wallace, Frank, George, Fred took a train to Colorado where they had family and stayed in Colorado for a year or maybe more until they returned to independence and then they moved into Madge Gates Wallace's parents' home at 219 North Delaware Street. That's the way the story is commonly told. I'd like to share with you a document. Sometimes a primary document can speak volume. I came across this document about a year ago. And sometimes, sometimes this document keeps me up at night. This is a probate document from the estate 
of David Willock Wallace. And again, we do not know why Bess Wallace's father took his own life, but it shows that he died on June 17th. And the probate report shows that, in essence, his estate did not exceed the sum of about $400. And that's all that we know. It doesn't talk about the house at 608 North Delaware. So we don't know much more about that, about the house. We don't know how much was owed on that house or who had the note on that house. We, we just don't know. But you'll see that this probate document was signed on September 16th, 1903 by Madge Wallace here in Independence. Again, what does that mean? Well, she was at least here in September of 1903 to sign this document. Now, does that mean that instead of being in Colorado for a year that they came back in September of 1903? Who knows? Does it mean that she came back just to sign the SMART document went back to Colorado and stayed longer, who knows? And how important is that? Probably not very important. But what we can say is that for this period of time after her father's death, there is just nothing that survives in Beth Wallace's hand, uh, no letters no photographs, nothing. There is a complete absence. It very much affected her. And we wish we had a little bit more insight into this. But sometimes the discovery of new primary documents can change how we know things. So in, at some point, she did move into 219 North Delaware Street with her mother and her three brothers, began a new life, and likely with the assistance of George and Elizabeth Gates, Bess Wallace attended the Barstow School in Kansas City, and you could see her grades from there. And I did a little bit of French there, and it simply says that she attended Barstow School with the assistance of her grandparents. And as you can see, she did well in, in French. And she excelled at Barstow, and she excelled in sports there, uh, particularly at tennis and at basketball. And so now, as a young woman, Miss Wallace had to adapt to a different type of life, but in a different way too, because her mother's life was forever changed. Madge Gates Wallace never recovered from the death of her husband, emotionally, mentally, physically. So Bess Wallace, had to become not only a primary caregiver of her mother, but of her three brothers. And that plays an important role in the other parts of our story. And so indeed, 219 North Delaware Street would be her new home and would be Beth Wallace Truman's home for the rest of her life if it was from 1904, indeed from 1904 until 1982.
Now, this photograph is taken inside of 219 North Delaware Street. And this is of the music room slash parlor. If you have been in the home, this is where the piano is today. And this is looking towards the north. And this is believed to be the first known photograph of the interior of 219 North Delaware Street. And so you see there Mrs. Madge Gates Wallace sitting there on the left. Bessie Wallace is sitting there on the floor. Frank Wallace is sitting on the couch to the left of his mother. George is standing there. And then the gentleman sitting on the chair by the window, we're not quite sure who he is. We suspect that he might be one of the Gates family relatives. When they moved into 219 North Delaware Street, it must have been a very interesting arrangement, whereas because Mr. and Mrs. Gates were getting older, they lived downstairs and Mother Wallace and the children lived upstairs, a very interesting living arrangement. Now, after they graduated in 1901, it doesn't seem as if Harry and Beth Wallace Truman had any communication whatsoever with one another. We're not even sure if Harry Truman had any idea what happened to Mr. Wallace in 1903, or if he did, he might have heard from his aunt and uncle, the Nolans across the street. I'm, I'm almost certain that he probably, probably did. In 1906, after holding some odd jobs in Kansas City, including working for the Star and then working for a couple of the banks in Kansas City, Harry Truman and his family returned to the family farm in Grandview. And after about four years of working on the family farm, one time Harry Truman was visiting his uncle Joseph and his aunt Ella and his cousin Ethel and his cousin Nellie at the Noland home at 216 North Delaware Street. And he looked across the street and at the Gates house and he said, gosh, I would really love to see Bessie again. And as luck would have it, a few days earlier, Mother Wallace had sent over some type of a dessert, a cake or a pie or something like that. And the common courtesy society dictated that the proper thing to do was to return the, the, the cake plate, the dessert plate. And they said, well, Harry, why don't you just take this plate back over there and maybe you can see Bessie? Well, the family tradition is that he ran across the street at the speed of light. He ran the bell and Bessie answered the door. Well, by this time in 1910, they had both been through a lot. They had both changed and Truman had changed physically. He had been working on the farm. He had put on a little bit of weight. He had put on some muscle heft. His skin was a little wind burnt, a little wind swept, a little sun burnt. He was a different physical specimen. She said, come in and they visited. And that's about all that we know. We don't know what date this was. We don't know how long they visited. And the family tradition says that he went back across the street to the Nolans and said, well, I saw her. We wish we knew more. Unfortunately, neither Beth nor Harry Truman ever talked about the famous cake plate story. The Nolans were the ones who talked about the story and thankfully they did. 
On December 31st of 1910, Harry Truman sat down and wrote the letter that you see on the screen there, My Dear Bessie. It was probably the first of what history knows as the famous Dear Beth letters. And Harry Truman was now beginning the most famous campaign of his life to win the heart of Beth Wallace. And he was going to begin it in earnest. Now the big question, can a farmer from Grandview win the heart of the granddaughter of one of the most well-to-do families in independence? We'll see. It was the most important campaign of Harry Truman's life. And those of you who have been part of a courtship, you know that it's really often more than just trying to win the heart of the other person. Quite often you're trying to win the heart of the other person's mother or the father or the brothers and sisters. And you're trying to win the approval of the family as well, because whether you're the, the, the boy or the girl, the man or the woman, you want to prove to the, the family of the other person that you're going to be able to, to take care of the other person financially and emotionally and, and spiritually. And Truman wanted to be able to prove to, to Madge Gates Wallace and to her brothers and to George Porterfield Gates and Elizabeth Gates that, yes, he was going to be able to, that he was worthy to take care of Beth Wallace Truman, that he was the right one for her. Now, being Beth Wallace Truman, a, a Beth Wallace, a beautiful young lady in a prominent family, she had other suitors from prominent families in town. Now, by this time, Beth Wallace was also getting older. Two of her brothers, Frank and George, had already married. Uh, George Wallace had uh, was already uh, dating a, a beautiful young lady by the name of May Southern. Uh, Frank Wallace was dating a beautiful young lady by the name of Natalie Ott. Uh, they would end up marrying. Uh, they were both handsome young men who married beautiful young ladies. Many were worried that Beth Wallace was going to turn into an, an old maid, but, but Beth Wallace certainly had her share of both. How could this farmer from Grandview measure up? There has been discussion among historians as to how the family in particular, Madge Gates Wallace viewed this match. And commonly the stories told that Mother Wallace didn't approve of the match. I take a little bit of a different approach on that. I think that Mother Wallace may have been concerned, but the primary evidence shows that Mother Wallace, while concerned, was rather supportive of the match. I love this photograph that I have up on the screen right now. This photograph is from around 1914 to 1915. This photograph is taken right to the east, looking almost right where my office is right now, looking towards the, the George Wallace home. You'll see a car in the background there that is a Kansas City made Stafford automobile that Harry Truman bought in 1914. And one of the things he used that car for was to drive up and see Miss Wallace. Bess Wallace is standing there on the left in front of Harry Truman. Madge Gates Wallace is standing there in the on the right side in the back with a beautiful smile on her face. 
And standing to her left is Mae Wallace, who ended up marrying Bess's brother, George, whose bedroom I'm talking to you from right now. Again, the primary evidence, and that primary evidence being these Dear Bess letters that I keep referring to, and there are over 1,200 of them, the evidence shows that that Mother Wallace was always sending love and Harry in response is give my love to your mother and such. And Harry Truman was frequently coming here for lunches and dinners and staying at 219 North Delaware Street or here in this house or in the Frank Wallace house next door. So while Harry Truman is always proving himself worthy, there doesn't seem to be this adversarial relationship in this courtship that the story is commonly told as being. Now, the suitor has got. So if the courtship started in 1910, which we believe, in June of 1911, he actually proposed for the first time. So in June of 1911, he wrote her, speaking of diamonds, would 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 you wear a solitaire on your left hand should I get it so within six months of writing his first letter to Miss Wallace he proposes to her now unfortunately the first uh, let, me, let me phrase it this year unfortunately none of Beth Wallace's letters from their courtship survive and it appears as if she turned him down by telephone but she replied, uh, he replied to her saying, well, you turned me down so wonderfully uh, that, that I'm almost happy anyway. But he had guts in proposing to her so early. But by 1913, they, they committed to one another. And she told him that if I'm going to marry anyone, I'm going to marry you. By 1917, it appears as if they had decided to get married, but then the Great War interrupted. Harry Truman, by this time, did not have to serve in World War I. He was old enough that he was old, too old for the draft. He was legally blind. He was on a farm. He was primary caregiver for his mother and sister. So he had all of these potential exemptions, but he wanted to serve in the war. In 1917, they talked about getting married. Beth wanted to get married, but amazingly, this time it was Harry who stepped back and said, no, not right now. Because he said, if something happens to me, if I get hurt, if I get maimed, or if I don't come back at all, it's not fair to you. So shortly before Truman embarked to serve in World War I, Bess Wallace had this portrait made up for him. And when Harry Truman wore his uniform to serve his country in World War I, his uniform blouse had two pockets. In one pocket, he kept a photograph of his mother and sister, and in the other, he kept this portrait of his sweetheart, Bess Wallace. And on the back of that photograph of Bess Wallace, I said, I'm depending on this to take you to France and back, all safe and sound. And my friends, you can still see the original of this portrait on President Truman's working desk at the Truman Library to this very day. Truman kept this photograph of Bess Wallace on his desk in the White House and kept it near him for the rest of his life photograph meant a lot to him.
Beth Wallace at home, like so many ladies in the war effort, did tremendous work to raise money and supplies for our soldiers fighting in Europe. And she helped raise over $35,000 for aid and relief work. That's an astonishing amount of money. We're talking in today's dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the ladies of Jackson County, Missouri, including Beth Wallace, the amount of work that they did for the American Red Cross in World War I is absolutely astounding. Harry Truman came home April of 1919. The earliest known letter from Bess Wallace to Harry Truman comes from then. And she tells him, you may as well entice, invite the entire 35th Division if you want to, because it's going to be your wedding as much as mine. And so on June 28th of 1919, they marched down the aisle together at Trinity Episcopal Church here in Independence, Missouri. And if you have not seen that photograph of Trinity Episcopal Church, well, I'm happy to show it to you today. It's relatively recently discovered. It was discovered a few years ago and was made public for the first time for the Truman's 100th wedding anniversary in 2019. And what the photograph doesn't show is that it was so hot on June 28th of 1919 that really within minutes, all of the beautiful flowers, the hollyhocks and all of those beautiful flowers started to wilt within minutes. But it was said that there was never a more eager bridegroom. You could almost say that for Harry Truman, it was a moment that had been in the making since 1890. He finally got the girl. The photograph of the happy couple was taken here, just a few feet from where I'm sitting in the yard of 219 North Delaware Street. One of the things that we preserve in the museum collection here at the Truman home, we have the wedding suit that President Truman wore at his wedding. Our good friends at the Truman Library, they have most of the dress and the shoes that the new Mrs. Truman wore at the wedding. So June 28th of 1919, one of the happiest days of their lives and they honeymooned in Michigan. Now, after their honeymoon, they came back here to Independence. It appears as if at least for a few days, they lived on the family farm in Grandview, but then they moved into the home here at 219 North Delaware Street. It appears as if Mr. Truman was hoping for a job in one of the investments that he had been part of a few years earlier with the Morgan Company, but that fell through. But shortly after they married in 1919, Harry Truman and one of his army buddies opened a haberdashery, what he called the shirt store in downtown Kansas City that did really well for a while. Uh, Harry Truman and a friend of his by the name of Eddie Jacobson opened the store close to the Muehlbach Hotel. Uh, did very well, as a matter of fact, for a while in downtown Kansas City. But unfortunately, as a result of a national recession, Truman and Jacobson started to fail in 1921. And it, to borrow a phrase from Abraham Lincoln, it, it winked. Now, Eddie Jacobson eventually chose to file from bankruptcy. Harry Truman did not file for bankruptcy. He chose to eventually pay off all of his debts. Beth Wallace Truman's brother, Frank, loaned Harry Truman some money, but eventually Harry Truman, with the help of his brother and some others, it took some time, but eventually paid off all of those creditors. But eventually, Harry Truman 
found another line of work. He Doug, found a yes. Just so you're aware, we are at eight fifteen. Okay, very good, very good. Harry Truman found his other calling in politics, and in 1922, Harry Truman won his first major elective win in politics as county judge for the Eastern District Judge position in Jackson County. That's basically all of Jackson County outside of Kansas City. He lost re-election, but eventually came back as presiding judge of Jackson County. Now, Beth Wallace Truman unfortunately suffered a couple of miscarriages, but in February of 1924 gave birth to their daughter, Mary Margaret Truman. And the way I have this phrase, baby made at least six. And the reason I said this was when Mary Margaret Truman was born, February 17th of 1924, at the time, there were four generations living inside of 219 North Delaware Street. Mrs. Elizabeth Emery Gates was living there. Madge Gates Wallace was living there. Harry and Bess Wallace Truman, now Margaret Truman, and Bess Wallace Truman's brother, Fred. They were all living inside of 219 North Delaware Street. So it was a large extended family. In 1934, for Harry Truman was elected to the United States Senate. And so the Trumans ended up going east. But the big question was who is now going to take care of Mrs. Truman's mother, Madge Gates Wallace, who was now going to be 73 years old. Eventually they got her an apartment not far from here, but eventually they took her to Washington DC with them but a bigger question, could the Truman family juggle two households on a $10,000 a year salary? One of the things that they did to do that was Harry Truman put his wife on his payroll. That proved to be a little controversial. And that proved to be controversial in 1944. Harry Truman made a name for himself as part of a famous committee that the press called the Truman Committee, where he investigated waste and fraud in defense spending. And eventually he was being talked about in 1944 as the vice presidential candidate for Franklin Roosevelt. And there were some people who were not really happy about Harry Truman potentially being vice president. One of those who seemingly wasn't happy about that was Mrs. Truman. One of the reasons it was suspected that Mrs. Truman might not be happy about that was that perhaps the Truman family finances might be stretched, might be exposed. There was also concern that the press being the press, the press might open up some other skeletons in the closet particularly about how Beth Wallace Truman's father died back in 1903. Could the press be trusted enough to respect the privacy of the family with that sensitive issue? The family was very sensitive about that. And so Mrs. Truman was intent on protecting her family about that. Maybe Mrs. Truman was sensitive about this. After her husband was elected and sworn as vice president of the United States, this scandal hit where her husband was photographed playing the piano with Lauren Bacall sitting on top of the piano. This was a big scandal early in her husband's vice presidency. But she was probably worried about this. April 12th, 1945, when Franklin Roosevelt died. People who knew, really knew about Franklin Roosevelt's health, knew that the odds of Roosevelt dying in that fourth term were great. April 12th, 1945, Harry Truman got the call, rushed to the White House, was told of what happened, 
He called the apartment, told Bess Truman what had happened, that Franklin Roosevelt died. I'm sending a car at 7.09 p.m. April 12, 1945. That scene happened. You can see that Bess Wallace Truman is not happy in that photograph. She knew that her life was never going to be the same again. Plus, she is sad that Franklin Roosevelt had died, but her life was now going to be turned completely upside down. This intently private woman was going to have to give up a sense of that privacy. She was going to have to partake in events like this. She did not like speaking in public. She did not like doing public events. She was not going to be another Eleanor Roosevelt. She was not going to christen ships like this very often. She was terrified that something like this was going to happen. She knew that her husband could be the target of assassins. And that's why on March 29th of 1952, when her husband announced that he was not going to run for another term, she had the biggest grin on her face that after almost eight years, they were going to come home. She didn't want to be First Lady of the United States. And so she could come home to independence. Her mother had died shortly before her husband left the White House. And so she was in mourning. She had lost her mother. So she had to adjust to, to living a life without her mother. So coming home to independence in 1953, she wanted to come home with her husband to what they called the center of the world and get to know her neighbors again and, and, and get to know her community and, and, and enjoy her church and, and get to know her hairdressers and go to the library and, and go to restaurants and go to the theater. And she wanted to resume as much of a normal life as she possibly could. She, she was happy when Margaret married Clifton Daniel in 1956, although she wasn't happy that Margaret picked opening day for Major League Baseball. But she was happy when Margaret had her first grandchild, the first of four. So Beth Wallace Truman found absolute happiness in being a grandmother and continued to be a loving aunt and being a loving grandmother and, and being a loving friend and a loving neighbor. She wonderfully agreed to, to do this wonderful interview in 1955, but rarely talked to the press. She never gave interviews. But to her friends and neighbors, she was simply Beth Wallace Truman. She traveled the world with her husband, but never made a fuss, never wanted a fuss made over her. She grieved in December of 1972. She and her husband celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary in 1969, but a few years later, she had to say goodbye to her husband. I can't imagine how difficult that must have been for her in 1972, not only having to say goodbye to her husband of 53 years, but to have to share that goodbye with so many others. That very private moment to have to share that with the entire world. Although at the same time, feeling that sense of gratitude that the world wanted to say goodbye to that man who, who meant so much to so many. But I hope that Mrs. Truman knew too that she meant a lot to people. She always listed in the top, in a list of top American women admired around the world. I hope that she knew that. Letters poured into her home all the time of people telling her, I hope you know how much we admire you. 
I hope that she knew that. And I hope that she took that to heart. And I hope that she knew that when she wrote her will, when she left her home to the American people, that she knew that she was making a difference. And that when she left us in October of 1982, that she inspired over 4 million people to come to her home since 1982 to learn about her and her family. That each of those people who have come through her home they have taken away a piece of her and that she has made all of our lives a little bit better. She packed a lot in the 97 years. She said she was born in independence. She wanted to die in independence. She was proud to be a native of independence. And the people of independence were proud to call her one of their own. And we certainly are proud to call her one of independence. Do we have any questions, Beth? Um, we have one in the chat right now. Okay. Um, it says, Doug, can you touch base on Bess's connection with the Swope family? I believe they mentioned her in the book, Deaths on Pre... Pleasant Street. Yes, yes. Not too far from here was the famous Swope Mansion associated with the famous Swope murders. One of the bows that I mentioned earlier, a young gentleman who courted Beth Wallace as a young lady was one of the, the Swope young men, and I can't remember which one. Um, forgive me on that. But I will tell you uh, an interesting story that late in life, one of Margaret Truman Daniels' friends reached out to Margaret and asked Margaret Daniel, do you think your mother will talk to me about the swope? And Margaret replied to her friend, well, I don't know, but I'll reach out and make an arrangement. So Margaret reached out to her mother. Her mother said, well, have your friend come by. So now by this time there was secret service here. They made all those arrangements. The friend came by with a tape recorder they had some pleasant trees, and um, Mrs. Truman evidently knew who this young lady was. And after the pleasant trees, the young lady said, I would like to ask you about your memories of the swopes, what you remember about the swopes, and what you, what you remember about the swope murders, and what you think happened there. And Mrs. Truman told her, said that, young lady, I will not speak to you or anybody on that matter. You can turn that machine off right now. We've got it. Unfortunately, um, that was it. And, and that's unfortunate because Mrs. Truman, I think, would have been a a wonderful fountain of primary knowledge on on that whole story. But she was of that generation where you didn't talk about that stuff. We've got another question. Mm -hmm. Was it assumed that Bess would donate the home to the government? When did she make that decision or were there other considerations for inheritance? Great question. And, and, and this is a very interesting technicality. The, the will was originally done in 1974. And this is, this is the interesting technicality. The will actually has that the home was to be left to the National Archives. 
And that's because there was the, the ongoing relationship with the Truman Library, okay? Um, now, there were a couple codicils to the will, uh, but it didn't change that. Um, now, it appears as if the director of the Truman Library was aware of this. And as Mrs. Truman was ailing in her last couple of years, the director of the Truman Library, knowing that by and large that the National Archives really didn't do much with historic homes, with the exception of perhaps the Eisenhower home over at the Eisenhower Library. The director of the Truman Library started having discussions with the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior. So Mrs. Truman died in October of 1982. And once the will started going into probate very quickly, that is when negotiations started happening with the National Archives and the National Park Service and the General uh, Services Administration. And then eventually Margaret Truman Daniel signed an agreement with the National Park Service and the General Services Administration. So, so yeah, it, it, it is a very interesting bureaucratic thing. So, and and what it really did too was it established what I think is just a wonderful working relationship between the National Park Service and the National Archives and the Truman Library. They are our BFFs over there. All right, well, that is all the questions that I see in chat. Um, I have emailed out the link to the survey to everyone, and I have also posted it here in chat. Um, so if you could fill it out and let us know how we did, that helps us get uh, more programs like these. And if you have other topics that you'd like to see, we always like to hear those as well. Very good. And, I did say that I ran long, and I'm very sorry, but yes. Um, we did record tonight's program. Uh, so in a couple of days, it should be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, if people uh, missed it or want to watch uh, parts of it again. And uh, Doug, uh, we want to thank you for a very interesting program. I learned a lot. And thank you, everybody who came this evening. And uh, we will uh, hopefully see everybody for future programs. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Go Royals. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.